Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Joaquim, Chief Dental Officer for Zufol Health Center, joined by Brian Wang, our Chief Information Officer, and we welcome you to today's uh, webinar. Next slide, please. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Participants will enter the session on mute to avoid any background noise during the presentation. Today's this webinar was planned as a 50-minute presentation by our guest speakers, followed by a 10-minute question and answer period from the chat. However, due to the great amount of useful information on controlling carries in the COVID-19 era that our speakers have to provide us today, you will have the option to stay logged on for an additional 30 minutes and earn a total of 1.5 continuing education units if you choose. If you're not able to stay connected, please note that this session will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you along with the slides within a week. CE credit is available only for those who attend the live stream and stay connected. To earn one CE credit, you must attend the live stream and stay connected for at least 45 minutes. To earn 1.5 credits, you must stay connected for at least 70 minutes. Please feel free to chat in your questions during the presentation. Questions that are not addressed during the session will receive a response directly to the email account associated with that question. If time allows, we will also take a few live questions at the end. You can raise your hand at that time to ask your question and you will be unmuted. A SurveyMonkey link will automatically pop up when you leave the session. If this does not pop up, don't panic, you will automatically receive an email with the link within 24 hours. Please complete the survey to receive your CE certificate if you are requesting dental credit. When you enter your information into the SurveyMonkey, please use the same email address as the email you used to register for this course. Make sure to enter your name as you want it to appear on the CE letter with complete words and capital letters where applicable. CE certificates will be sent out within two weeks. Zufol Health will be offering a series of webinars over the next few weeks and you are invited to attend. Next slide, please. Support for the Zufol webinar series is provided by Horizon Foundation of New Jersey. Next slide, please. We are pleased to be joined today by our guest speakers, Michelle Wright, Carolyn Hole Nojek, as well as an additional guest speaker, Dr. Bill Moss, as a bonus treat for you today. Dr. Moss is a dental public health consultant and has an appointment as a clinical professor at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry. During 36 years of federal service, Dr. Moss served in the Indian Health Service, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he directed the Oral Health Division for 10 years. Dr. Moss has a particular interest in the control of dental caries in underserved communities, and since 2016, he has served as a faculty on the Sealant Improvement Collaboratives of the National Network for Oral Health Access, NOAA. Our second speaker, Michelle Wright, is a special market accountant uh, account manager for GC America. She has over 20 years of dental experience, including chairside assisting and practicing dental hygiene. She has worked in various roles, including distribution, manufacturing, marketing, and business development. Her passion is education um, and educating clinicians on minimally um, uh, interventions, minimal interventions uh, in dentistry. Our last speaker is Carolyn Hole Nojek. She is the East Region Key Accountant uh, account Speaker, apologize, uh, for GC America, and she has 20 years of dental experience, including chairside assisting. She has also extensive experience in CAD CAM training, uh, support, education, and manufacturing. Her focus is on creating efficiency within the team and educating patients uh, to improve outcomes. I turn it over now to Dr. Moss.
Thank you, Sam, and greetings uh, to participants. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, pleased to be able to uh, open this discussion on the topic of controlling carries in the COVID-19 era, realizing that the shutdown of our clinics helped us realize how important it was to control carries because people with toothaches uh, were having difficulty uh, providing a source of care and we were having difficulty providing care to them. It really height sharpened our awareness of how important it is to control caries, to keep it from being symptomatic. And, uh, and the title of this is the COVID-19 era, recognizing that we're just at the beginning of what could be many months, if not year long or more process, where there's going to be ups and downs in terms of what we're allowed to do and what's going on in the way of COVID transmissions. We wanna make the most of the time when our clinics are open to help control caries in as many people as possible try to get to the other side of this epidemic uh, with as a little morbidity as possible. If you go to the CDC website for their guidance about uh, infection control in the COVID era, uh, you will see this key principle, which says to prioritize the most critical dental services and provide care in a way that minimizes harm to patients from delaying care and harm to personnel from potential exposure. Emphasis on prioritizing the critical services, suggesting we may not be able to business as usual and do it in a way that it's assumed that we're not going to harm the patients with their dental services and, we'll do it, and we're going to do it in a way that protects them from COVID, but do it in a way that minimizes the harm from delaying care and then also protecting our personnel as we do it. So I'm gonna ask the question, is controlling caries in a population where dental caries is a threat to their well-being, a critical dental service? I think the answer is yes. And in this um, uh, era, we've learned how important it is, uh, how important dental care is for people with dental caries. Those people that were symptomatic had trouble accessing care and we had trouble providing uh, care for them. But how about restoring a form and function? Is that a critical dental service? In some patients, perhaps, but for the most part, I think it, anything that can be deferred uh, until we get to the other side of this is something that uh, may not be something that we would say prioritizes the most critical dental service. And where the decision has to be made really is how that affects your clinic capacity and, your, and, and the productivity uh, that might affect the delaying of care. How do you manage demand? Are there waiting lists? Um, now, if there's a waiting, if you've changed every protocol as efficiently as possible in your treatment plans and you still have a waiting list, that may just be because demand outstrips your ability to provide care. But if you're kind of in business as usual mode or seeking to be in business as usual mode, um, that may not be the best way to assure that you're reducing the number of people that have the potential to have be harmed by the delaying of care. After all, being on a waiting list almost by definition says care is being delayed. Um, the flip side of this, of course, is what's the relative risk to the healthcare personnel of the different treatment options we may have? As much as we'd like to have point of service testing, we know there's a certain percentage of false negatives that may vary by age, by the presenting symptoms or lack of symptoms, or the, uh, and the prevalence of community transmission. Um, so we can't ever be sure that a patient is COVID negative. For children, in fact, we've been told to assume that because they are often so asymptomatic uh, yeah, and yet still COVID pos positive, we have to assume they're COVID positive. And while we may be, at this time think they're not good spreaders of the virus, we just don't know enough uh, now to be cavalier about this at all. I don't wish to make light of uh, the many oral diseases and conditions uh, that uh, your patients uh, uh, may have problems with, but I think for most of the patients uh, in our practice, uh, dental caries is far and away the greatest oral disease threat to their health and well-being um, throughout their lives. We know that the teeth on the far right here, the two, the two teeth in the far right, if they are not already causing a problem, uh, it's very likely they will cause a problem soon. Uh, and if possible, we would like to treat that disease before it causes symptoms. We know dental caries is a chronic disease, so we would actually like to intercept and arrest caries at every stage uh, from the sound tooth on the left uh, up until um, the point where the, the caries becomes cavitated. Uh, now, 
having a dental program to address that disease, having a dental program that's open and able to treat people even before their disease is so bad they have symptoms, being able to treat them with a healthy and productive staff is very important for your communities. But what do we do about those two teeth on the right uh, with the cavitated lesions? Fortunately, modern dental science has given us some options for managing those cavitated lesions and minimize the use of aerosol producing hand pieces or the three wear or water syringes, uh, thus uh, enabling us to treat the condition uh, without jeopardizing the safety of providers. The University of North Carolina provided guidance uh, shortly after uh, all clinics all across the nation closed. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware of them. Um, the, the guidance can be found on the uh, website of the oral of the North Carolina Oral Health Coalition uh, under COVID-19. You may even have used those methods, uh, which are principally silver diamine fluoride and interim therapeutic restorations, uh, whether you've received the guidance from North Carolina or not. Now, um, we have a lot of evidence that uh, these interim therapeutic restorations on the class one cavity that we saw on the slide before could survive at least four or five years before they would need to be replaced. And even the class two cavity that we saw, the two surface cavity, uh, would very likely, uh, 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 an interim therapeutic restoration could very likely um, uh, maintain, uh, arrest the caries and maintain uh, health for a year or two until we get past the current crisis. Now, I know a criticism of the interim therapeutic restoration is the fact that explicitly uh, anesthesia is not used, drills are not used, and uh, caries uh, is often left uh, at the base of the cavity preparation. And dentists are concerned that, well, you know, I'm going to have to re-enter that tooth at a later date to remove all the caries before a final restoration. Uh, now, as clinics have opened up, um, we can uh, do a traditional restoration using um, rubber dam, for example, and high volume evacuation. But I'm gonna challenge that notion that we need to do anything other than an interim therapeutic restoration during the time of this uh, epidemic uh, if in fact our goal is to arrest caries. Whether we are preparing a tooth for an interim therapeutic restoration or for additional dental restoration, if our goal is to have the patient not have any symptoms during the next year when we know um, accessing dental care will be difficult, how important is complete caries removal? And I believe the answer is it's not. What is important is optimal caries removal. Selective, partial, incomplete caries removal is associated with maximum tooth survival compared to complete caries removal. There are fewer pulp exposures and fewer signs and symptoms of pulpal disease. And what do I mean by optimal caries removal? Well, it's selective. Selective in that there's attention to complete caries removal around the periphery, the axial walls, and the purpose is to maximize the fusion of the restorative material with mineral dense tooth tissue. And it's selective in that there's an incomplete, if necessary, caries removal of the pulpal floor, if that is necessary to avoid pulp exposure. The attention here is to respecting the pulp, to treat the odontoblast tenderly, and will rely on the seal of the restoration to isolate the caries bacteria. When I was still in clinical practice, this might have been considered to have been good dental care. The goal is to remove all the decay. And if the decay was so deep that there was a pinpoint pulp exposure, well, it was just unfortunate the decay was so deep that I had no choice. But actually, we now know that is not good dental care. Since at least 2008, We've known that it's best to leave behind infected dentin if removal of it would put the pulp at risk of exposure. And we know this from the findings of three randomized control trials, one of which ran for 10 years. We now understand that karyogenic bacteria, once isolated from the source of nutrition, either die or remain dormant and thus, po dormant and thus 
propose no risk to the health of the dentition. And this was not published in some obscure journal. This was published in the Journal of American Dental Association in the section called Clinical Practice. I would go so far as to say that incomplete caries ex excavation is the standard of care. And it has been at least since 2014, which was the first time this guidance appeared in Pediatric Restorative Dentistry Best Practices of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. They cited evidence from trials and systematic reviews that incomplete caries removal in, prime, in both primary and permanent teeth, whether there was normal pulps or teeth with reversible pulpitis, resulted in fewer pulp exposures and fewer signs and symptoms compared to complete caries excavation. Now, I do want to make sure that we don't misinterpret the third finding. The third finding was evidence that a one-step excavation followed by placement of the final restoration led to higher success in maintaining pulp vitality than a two-step process that some had advocated where a, in term, where a temporary filling was placed with partial caries removal and then followed at a later time by complete caries removal and the final restoration. It's, this is not saying that if you replaced an interim therapeutic restoration a year or two later, it would have worse outcome than if you had done the definitive restoration in the first place. What it is saying is if you need to replace an interim therapeutic restoration because the, cat, the uh, restoration no longer is protecting the dent of the tooth, then just remove as much um, of the glass ionomer as you need to to place the new filling. If glass ionomer is still intact at the base of that uh, interim therapeutic restoration, simply leave it, uh, again, respecting the pulp. About 75% of the tooth decay that occurs in school-aged children and adolescents occurs on the pits and fissures of the first and second permanent molars. Unfortunately, more, we see more teeth that look like the ones on the left and center of this sequence than we do teeth on the right. It used to be quite common for a dentist to watch these molars. They would recognize that the ones in the middle had something going on. You could see some stains at the very least and perhaps some decay starting in those deep fissures. And uh, recognizing that they were concerned about that, dentists would watch them. They would wait and then eventually the cavity would happen. Um, we now realize that thing to do rather than watch those teeth is to apply a sealant. At the other extreme are those who, quote, don't believe in sealants, uh, but do know that the ultimate outcome of watching will be that they'll need to restore the teeth, so they proceed with restoring teeth with incipient lesions. I don't think that would be a good use of a dentist time even before COVID-19, but now certainly when we want to maintain a, a productive clinic with the capacity to provide dental treatment to patients before they develop symptoms, any aerosol generating procedure needs to be justified. So my question is, is restoration of incipient curious lesions the standard of care? The answer is no. The answer is since 2008, when the American Dental Association published its first clinical practice guidelines on pit and fissure sealants was no. <clears throat> and by 2016, we have any, even more evidence and could make even clearer recommendations. Now the 2016 guidelines, which were jointly issued between the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, um, we recognize those are both conservative organizations that are quite cautious about telling dentists what they ought to do. But they did conclude that sealants are effective in preventing and arresting caries in both primary and permanent molars and could minimize the progression of non-cavitated occlusal carious lesions. But there's a critical objective that, uh, adjective that they used. They referred to this as a strong recommendation, and the definition of a strong recommendation is that in most situations, clinicians should follow the course of action suggested by the panel, and only in a selected few circumstances may they need to deviate from it. In other words, um, it, it would be up to the dentist who did not want to follow those guidelines to explain why the situation 
and that particular case, this particular patient, this particular time required them to deviate from those recommendations. Again, this evidence is not buried in some obscure journals. While it's true that some may have difficult accessing the Cochrane uh, database, uh, all of these other uh, reviews and guidelines are available for free on the website of the American Dental Association Evidence-Based Care. Uh, that it reiterates, I believe, that it has to be considered a standard of care for the profession. One doesn't need to be a member of the ADA or AAPD to access these guidelines. These are in the part of the website that anyone can access for free. And so while there may be membership benefits uh, to participating in developing these guidelines, the standards really are clear for the entire profession. Broadly representative experts have continued to have been convened by the American Dental Association to review the evidence to provide clinical practice guidelines. Guidelines for non-restorative, which is to say also non-surgical management of carious lesions was issued in October of 2018. Let's realize this was almost a year and a half before we faced the COVID-19 crisis. So the science was leading our profession to consider non-surgical, non-restorative approaches to our best caries well before uh, COVID-19 uh, increased our attention to these methodologies. Now, they are also working on guidelines for restorative management of caries, and we expect those, I believe, next year. But I wanna focus on these that were just issued because they reiterate for non-cavitated occlusal carious lesions the value of sealants. Perhaps I moved off that previous slide a little bit too quickly. Another point I should have made is, well, it, you know, most dentists acknowledge that sealants are effective in preventing decay before it starts. Those more recent guidelines that I referred to were specifically focusing on the arresting of known decay, known but still non-cavitated decay. And it, was a, and it was for those teeth that pit and fissure sealants were recommended. But actually we've had a sealants available to us for 30 decades uh, at least, and yet still today, barely 50% of children have sealants. Some have, still, some have teeth that have not yet had sealants replaced but remain sound. Others have teeth that have cavities and others have teeth that are filled. But for some reason, we've only been able to reach about half of them with sealants. And a 2001 survey confirmed that the barrier to use was that dentists were concerned about inadvertently sealing over caries. Now I realize that was 2001, that was well before two guideline panels had said, uh, yeah, we should seal over caries, that that's effective. But even recently, a collaborative of a dentist from uh, community health centers that had been convened specifically to improve their clinic's use of fissure sealants uh, reported that they did not ever intentionally seal over decay. 28% did not intentionally seal over decay. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what would be the consequences of sealing over decay? Answering the question, what are the consequences of sealing over decay? was critical for the 2008 uh, panel that uh, developed the clinical practice guidelines. And um, they were very much influenced by this uh, study, which included four randomized controlled trials, which found that sealing non-cavitated caries in permanent teeth was effective in reducing caries progression. 71% compared to teeth that were sealed, where, uh, lesions had not been sealed up to five years after sealant placement. One reason the 2016 guidelines were so much stronger than the 2008 guidelines, I think, was that we continued to study, address those concerns about sealing over carious lesions. And in this study, teeth with clearly active carious lesions were sealed. 
with clear sealants. The study design was that they would observe these teeth, monitor them visually with uh, diagnodent, uh, with radiographs, and look for signs of caries progression. Uh, to protect the patients, they had a rule that if, this, if the uh, caries proceeded to the point of cavitation, which is an ICDAS score of five or more, or if radiographically the decay extended halfway to the dentin, uh, that they would immediately um, restore that tooth before any further damage was done. In this study, sealant retention was 70% at 44 months, almost four years, and that's pretty consistent with what we know about sealants uh, that are resin sealants that are placed under the ideal conditions. Regardless of lesion severity, sealants were 100% effective in uh, controlling, stopping any progression of decay at 12 months and 98% effective over 44 months, almost, over almost four years in managing occlusal surfaces at those incipient decay levels, clearly decay short of frank cavitation. Now I want you to pay particular attention to that point about sealant retention being only 70% and yet uh, lesions uh, did not progress in 98% of the time because we'll come back to that point a bit later. One of the questions the expert panel was asked to answer was whether there was whether one type of sealant material was better than another. They were unable to make a specific recommendation on the relative merits of one type of material over the other. It was clear that most studies showed resin-based sealants to have superior retention over longer periods of time than glass ionomer-based sealants. But we have to ask, is that even the right question? Because in looking at caries prevention, caries reduction, the effects seem to be similar, at least over the short term. The panel did note that they had few studies, and the studies they did have were of low quality, so there was un, uh, too much uncertainty to make a specific recommendation. The panel recommended that clinicians take into account the likelihood of experiencing lack of retention when choosing sealants, and to be very specific about what sealants should be, what, which sealant should be used for specific patient and clinical scenario predicated largely on the ability to isolate and dry the tooth. If good isolation could be secured, resin was likely to be retained better. But there's many situations where we know moisture control is not ideal. And in those situations, such, such as the partially erupted lower molar uh, on your, in your photo here, a glass ionomer was clearly preferable. But wait, didn't you say that resin sealants were more likely to be retained than glass ionomer sealants. How can glass ionomer sealants control caries after they've been lost? Well, studies have looked specifically at what happens to teeth after sealants have been lost, and they've found that in the three years after a sealant is lost, those with, that had been sealed with resin sealants were four times more likely to experience decay than those that had been sealed by glass ionomer. So let's think a little bit more about why it was so important not to just wait that uh, for that uh, partially erupted tooth that we saw on the previous slide to erupt into a more full occlusion where we could, um, where we could uh, more easily isolate it and place a good resin sealant. Emerging molars are highly susceptible. The surface enamel has not yet fully matured. Furthermore, there's a lack of occlusal contact. It may take some of those teeth uh, up, to, up to a year and a half or two years before they come into full occlusion. During that time, plaque is retained on the occlusal surface before the teeth are in occlusion where the food's going to uh, remove it or even, you know, better yet, uh, chewing some sugar-free gum. And we know the six and seven-year-olds may not have strong toothbrushing habits yet. I mean, it doesn't take much to brush the chewing surfaces of your teeth, but it may be a little bit much to expect six and seven-year-olds regularly to do that. Three years after eruption, however, those teeth are much less susceptible. The enamel has become more highly mineralized, especially if it's had access to daily fluoride exposure, either through toothpaste, water, or beverages made from fluoridated water. And in those cases, the surface enamel is, is, converts hydroxyapatite to fluorapatite wherever the karyogenic plaque have existed. And three years after the teeth have erupted, nine and 10-year-olds may be more reliable and skilled 
toothbrushers. One advantage of glass ionomer is that if glass ionomer is placed on those teeth uh, it, it just as soon as possible, before the enamel has fully matured, the microporosity of the glass ionomer sealant allows the enamel to mature. There's just enough flow of minerals and fluid uh, that the tooth can continue that maturation process. That is not the case with resin sealants. Resins, while they're, they keep bacteria from penetrating into the tooth, they also prevent any uh, minerals or fluids from going to the tooth surface. Moreover, glass ionomer has high levels of fluoride, which diffuse into the glass ionomer, again, strengthening that surface layer. And glass ionomer material can be retained deep into the fissures, glass, whereas resin sealants tend to flake off in large chunks uh, as retention is lost, the purely mechanical retention is lost, glass ionomer is more likely to wear away. And so you can wear away uh, the chewing surface and still retain it in the deep fissures where it can continue to uh, seal the bacteria off from the biofilm and keep the bacteria from progressing. In conclusion, both glass ionomer and resin-based sealants exhibit significant caries preventive and caries arresting effects. Therefore, both materials are equally suitable for clinical application as fissure sealant materials. But in the COVID-19 era, the ease of use of glass ionomer and the lack of aerosol generation, as you'll learn about in a few minutes, suggests that it may be superior, if not for the individual patient, then for the community, by enabling more patients to be seen at lower cost and at least risk to staff. And uh, I hope I'll be able to join you by phone for some questions. And if we don't have time for questions, I'll be happy to answer any uh, that you give to Dr. Joachim and he'll, he'll send to me and we'll respond to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moss. We appreciate all of that fabulous um, information. Bear with me one minute while I'm trying to share my screen here. Hold on one second. Bear with me one second. Here we go. Sorry about that. Let's see. Okay, I just want to ask Brian, can you see that? Sorry, I was having a little bit of technical difficulties there. You're good. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. Sorry about that. I appreciate you guys' patience uh, with this. Um, I do thank you again, Dr. Moss, um, for all that wonderful um, information. So again, my name is Michelle. I'm with GC America, and we're going to talk more about incorporating the glass ionomer preventive and restorative materials, especially now um, that we're all working in a COVID-19 world. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about minimal intervention dentistry, how glass ionomers play a role in that, um, you know, creating um, minimal aerosol flow within the, uh, within the clinical setting, um, effectiveness of GIs, the science behind it, preventive options and restorative options as well. So what is MI, minimal intervention dentistry? So essentially minimal intervention dentistry is the modern medical approach to the management of decay. So the days of drilling, filling, drilling, filling is not necessarily the standard of care. You know, with the technology and the new products that we have out there, um, it allows us to uh, practice minimal intervention dentistry and the fact that we can be very conservative um, in our prep. And as Dr. Moss was saying before, in certain um, cases where we can leave, you know, some of the decay or incipient lesions um, there, we can actually restore those materials um, without having to drill out extensive amount of tooth surface. 
So I like to think of minimal intervention dentistry as three components. First, we want to identify, you know, what's causing dental caries. I think that's probably key in helping us decide, you know, how invasive that we can be um, in our treatment options. And then also in a, from a preventive perspective, we want to focus on, you know, reju rejuvenating tooth structure and remineralizing and strengthening the enamel. And then there's obviously going to be areas where, you know, we have to do full on restorative procedures on these patients, but we have a lot of products out there that help us conserve tooth structure um, if it uh, leads to that. So glass ionomers are essential um, in clinical practice because of the following. We know that um, they are versatile materials. Um, they are self-adhesive to both enamel and dentin. These are great biocompatible uh, materials. I know biocompatible uh, uh, or bioavailable is kind of a buzzword out there, but glass ionomers have always been great for biocompatibility. Uh, they have chemical cure, which we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, um, and then no shrinkage stress. So I bring this up when we talk about minimally invasive dentistry that GIs are well suited for minimally invasive, uh, both preventive and restorative techniques. Oftentimes people think about glass ionomers for restorative, but there's a lot of great products out there to help with the preventive aspect as well. So how does MI dentistry play a role in the COVID-19 world? I understand that there's a lot of people from all over the country that are probably listening to um, this webinar. So um, I know there's a lot of people that are in different stages of the opening process. Um, I'm, I live down in the South, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm sure you guys picked up on the accent there. Um, but we've actually, our offices here have been open again for two months now. And then I understand there's parts of the country that are, are just beginning to open. So there's a lot of new guidelines. And so I understand that the CDC and the, the states have put a lot of different guidelines out there. So I know that they may be different from state to state. Um, and then I also know that oftentimes guidelines can be interpreted um, in different ways. But I'm actually currently working with, or me and my team are actually working with um, three different national entities. And one of the common um, things that's happening in this process is the elimination or minimizing of aerosol spray, especially within the hygiene department. Um, I'm working with a group right now that has actually said that they are not um, allowing any aerosol sprays within the hygiene department, but they are doing minimized aerosol sprays within um, the restorative department. So, you know, that can really put a damper on some of the procedures uh, that we do. Um, also eliminating aerosol sprays and modifying hygiene, you know, what else does that look like? You know, for a lot of offices, it means utilizing hand instruments versus sonic or ultrasonic instruments modifying plaque and stain removal versus full mouth coronal polishing. Um, there are some offices out there that are uh, using uh, no use of air, air polishing, no use of air water syringe, and because of this they are utilizing hydrophilic sealant um, material as their choice of sealant. Now in a restorative procedure, what does modified restorative techniques look like? Well again, first our objective is to provide long-term restorative care while minimizing aerosols. You know, what does that look like? What are examples of this? First, we wanna think about the management of cavitated carious lesions in a vital tooth. Um, we want to incorporate minimal intervention, which would be removal of soft, moist, discolored dentin, um, the infected dentin with hand instruments such as spoon excavating or slow speed burr. Uh, we want to leave behind hard, dark colored dentin uh, we also want to limit um, excavating in deep cavities. Uh, we want to try to obtain those uh, margins in sound den. We also want to, the way we can do this is restore with glass ionomer or glass hybrid restoratives. Um, and the advantage of that would be, again, it's a self adhesive chemical cure uh, material that bonds to tooth structure, bonds in moist dent, and so does not require isolation, which is always a plus when you're working in the mouth. And then the material also has high fluoride release to help prevent and oftentimes arrest um, the caries process. So how effective are GIs? I mean, I could go on, on and on all day long and I understand that I'm the GC America route, but there are tons of studies out there that back the efficacy of GIs. Um, one of the best statements um, that I actually found when doing some of this research was on Oral Health's website. And I'm just gonna do this verbatim because I think this says it best. So according to the Oral Health Group website, 
glass ionomers, and keep in mind, this has cement in parentheses, but this doesn't mean necessarily yes, you're looting cement. All glass ionomers are classified as a cement per se, but whether you're talking about Fuji ion, Fuji 2, LC, you know, they're all a glass ionomer cement. They just have different chemistries that allow you to do it for different reasons. So this is all glass ionomers in general. Release fluoride ions at around 1%. Um, that's above 5,000 parts per million. Um, that will effectively kill any karyogenic bacteria still present in the outer perimeter of the karyous lesion. Glass ionomers protect the margins of the restorations from recurrent decay. So again, glass ionomers are definitely an effective choice at any time, but it's definitely during um, this COVID era in which we're working in. So again, the proof is in the science. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I wanted to put these references up there. So if any of you are, are interested in, you know, looking at the science behind glass ionomers, please take a screenshot of this. I also believe Dr. Joachim and his group were actually going to share um, this literature, but there are tons of studies out there that talk about using glass ionomer restoratives in the art technique, you know, using sealants in conjunction with the art technique. Glass ionomer, high viscosity glass ionomers versus composite resins. Um, again, the art technique versus amalgam restorations. I mean, we could just go on and on and on, but these are really some great resources. If you're not currently using glass ionomers, why you should incorporate glass ionomers into your practice. So what is a glass ionomer? You know, I know there's a lot of you on here that have taken tons of biomaterial courses. There also may be some people on here that are not as well versed in biomaterials. So I always like to discover, you know, what a glass ionomer is because it helps us differentiate why it's different from resins. So glass ionomers, if you've ever worked with them in the past, you know, you may have mixed that powder and liquid before. Uh, you may notice that it comes in a capsule or in some of the cements, a double barrel syringe. And it, the reason is, is it comes in two components that have to be kept separated. So they have to be packaged separately than resins. Um, but the base or your powder is typically a calcium fluoro aluminum silicate glass or a strontium fluoro aluminum silicate glass in the newer glass ionomers and a water soluble polyacrylic acid. So once those two materials bind together and, and reach the two surface, it creates what we call this acid base reaction or this chemical reaction. And it also starts releasing fluorides, which last for relatively long periods of time. The features and benefits of glass ionomers, well, one, they're hydrophilic. They work well in a moist environment. As a matter of fact, you want moisture available, which I know if you've not worked with glass ionomers, it's totally goes against everything that you're taught, but they love, they love moisture, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. Very easy to use. No etching, no bonding. It's not technique sensitive. You know, in some aspects, it's technique sensitive in how it's mixed, but it is not technique sensitive when you're using it um, in the mouth. Uh, as kind of a side joke at GC, we always talk about glass ionomers as being dental duct tape. So when your regular restorations don't do the job properly, glass ionomers are great for that. There is exceptional fluoride release. Um, but the glass ionomers not only just release fluoride, they have a rechargeable fluoride, which Dr. Moss mentioned that a few slides ago. So uh, glass ionomers have what we call a semi-permeable skin that actually absorbs other fluoride ions. So if they're using a fluoride toothpaste, they're using, um, you know, a, a prescription um, toothpaste with fluoride, you know, it'll actually promote uh, the recharge of fluoride. And there's actually studies out there that I would love to send to you guys that actually talk about the fluoride release of, um, or how the recharge of fluoride uh, happens, especially when using the MI Pace product. So we can definitely send that to you guys as a follow up. And again, it chemically bonds to the teeth, which is completely different than your resins, which have what we call a mechanical reaction. So I'm a visual person um, and normally I have visual aids, but this is a virtual uh, call. So normally what happens when I think about a mechanical reaction, mechanical reactions are kind of like if you think about the zipper on your jeans or your shorts, how the zipper just kind of interlocks into one another. Mechanical reaction is kind of that same concept, right? So you can kind of see the ins and outs um, of where one starts and one ends. A chemical bond is, is different. It kind of chemically fuses into one another. So if you look at the slide at the bottom, the bottom layer is actually the dentin surface and the top layer is the glass ionomer restorative. 
If you see that line in the middle, that chemical fuse zone, um, that's actually, you can't even tell where the dentin begins and where the glycyonomer begins because they just really almost bind together like one. So this is what we call the acid resistant interdiffusion uh, zone. So when we talk about chemical reaction, this is the reaction that's actually taking place. In order for this chemical reaction to happen, glycyonomers actually seek hydrogen ions to help with the chemical bond. That's why glycyonomers work well in a moist environment. And I'll reiterate on this a little bit more, but two of the biggest mistakes that people make when using glycyonomers is they acid etch, which pulls moisture out of the tooth surface, or they overdry the teeth. Now you don't want the area pooling in saliva, but you definitely want saliva there. So keep that in mind when you're using glass ionomers. You want moisture there because it helps with the chemical bond, which actually gives you um, uh, the benefits of the glass ionomer. Glass ionomers also keep bacteria out. So while it allows calcium and phosphate ions into the tooth surface, it keeps other bacteria out, uh, but it does allow the calcium, phosphate, and fluoride ions to penetrate and maturate the tooth surface. So disadvantages of composite. Let me just first say I'm not anti-composite. So okay, GC has a lot of great composites out there on the market. Um, and I think I personally think there's a place for composites. I think there's a place for gloss ionomers. And in some patients, you can actually use both. And Kara's going to get a little bit into that of how you can use the two together. Um, but disadvantages of composites, though, is they are moisture sensitive. And I know there's some products out there that say you can use it in slightly moist. There is, but let's face it, we all know that slightly moist is really almost no moisture at all. So they're moisture sensitive. Again, there's no chemical adhesion. So uh, what happens is you're more likely to see potential shrinkage when using composites, which then leads to possible micro leakage, marginal discoloration, and it also allows for bacterial penetration. Also, when using composites, there's no acid base reaction that's taking place, which means there's no ion exchange and then there's no fluoride uptake. So again, Composites are great restoratives, but all they're doing is they're just a, a, a placeholder for from when you excavated uh, the decay and left a hole. So again, you know, the glycyonomers are a biocompatible material. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a glycyonomer sealant. And for those of you that have ten, attended some NOAA presentations, I did talk about this. So I did try to incorporate um, a little bit different slides, slides to not repeat myself. But I love this material, and it's not because I sell this material. I practice hygiene, and I personally used to struggle with sealants, and I think Fuji Triage is the best thing since sliced bread. Love this material. It has a lot of great features and benefits. There's a lot of studies that back the efficacy, and if I ever go back into doing hygiene full time, I will, do, I will use this material. Um, but this uh, gloss ionomers, the Fuji Triage, is an effective way to treat and protect caries prone molars, which all molars, in my opinion, are caries from. So there you go. So the features and benefits of the Fuji triage has the same great benefits as the what we mentioned before. No etching, no bonding, works well in moist environments, releases fluoride. But in addition to that, this is a self-cure material. So from start of mix to full setup, it takes about two and a half minutes for the material to set up. But the great thing about it is it is a self-cure material. So you don't have to use a cure and light which you know, is an additional instrument that you have to sterilize. So that's a plus there. You can apply this on all molars. As a matter of fact, you can apply this on all occlusal surfaces. So I have some doctors that seal both molars and premolars with this. Um, I used to target this as a way to treat partially erupted molars, but with all the studies that back the efficacy and the benefits of the triage, I would recommend this on all molars, partially erupted molars, areas where you can't get a dry field, fully erupted molars, incipient lesions. I would treat all molars with this. Um, this actually has exceptional fluoride release. This product and one more product that Kara is going to talk about, these two particular products actually release six times more fluoride um, than any of the other glass ionomers out there on the market. Again, it has a rechargeable fluoride, um, so it promotes the building of the flora appetite. No need to adjust occlusion. Uh, the, this glass down in particular will wear into occlusion. So I know a lot of people ask me, well, you know, what do we do about adjusting the occlusion? I place uh, the Fuji triage sealants on my knees, and usually if they are hitting on it a little bit, within a couple of days, it wears into occlusion. So again, no need to bring out a hand piece to scare the kids, first of all, and that's an additional instrument you have to sterilize. So again, you place the glass ionomer sealant, allow it to set up, and that's it. 
This is a low viscosity material. So for those of you out there that are used to using like Fuji 2LC, Fuji 9, you're used to the higher viscosity material. This is a low viscosity, which some people, particularly as hygienists that aren't used to using restoratives, um, it is a lower viscosity, so it mimics some of the other um, stainless we use. So it, it, some people find this a little bit easier to place. And it's cost and time effective. You can do all four six-year molars in less than five minutes. As a matter of fact, one capsule easily um, allow you to seal six to eight teeth. Um, but we know most time people are doing uh, six-year molars. You can easily do all four six-year molars um, in, in less than five minutes. So a lot of people actually incorporate this and do this the same day as a profile. So again, this is, the, in my opinion, the ideal sealant um, to use, whether we're in COVID or uh, post. So the glass ionomer, the, or the Fuji triage in particular, let's talk about the fluoride release because you talk about exceptional fluoride release, but what does that mean? See this top line, this uh, greenish line at the top. This is actually the initial fluoride release that you get um, with the Fuji triage. In comparison to the average competitor glass ionomer, which is the red line at the bottom, so it does release a significant amount of fluoride, but you can see the big difference there. And then if you squint really hard and look at the bottom, that blue line at the bottom, is some of the resin sealants that claim to release fluoride. So technically, does it release fluoride? Sure. But let's face it, if you're using a glass ionomer material, you're probably using it for a reason. So you want this high fluoride release. So again, if I'm using glass ionomers, you know, for the fluoride and the biocompatibility aspect of it, I would go with the Fuji triage, if nothing else, for this reason. At, uh, for this reason. <clears throat> So Dr. Moss talked on, uh, about this, and I'm so glad he mentioned this because I do get this question a lot, you know, what about the retention rate of glass ionomers? Because glass ionomers do have a bad rep for wearing and washing out. So people ask me, how long does a glass ionomer last? I think that all depends. I've seen, you know, depends on the patient, their bite, their chewing habits. Studies have shown though that glass ionomers are not as likely to pop out per se, because remember, resins have a mechanical reaction Glass ionomers have a chemical reaction. So typically what happens is if you don't see that glass ionomer, oftentimes the glass ionomer is there, it just wears down into the grooves. I have personally seen photos that were five years post-op, seven years post-op, and the glass ionomer was still there. And then I've seen some uh, clinically, uh, some, Fuji, some patients that use had Fuji triage that were two years post-op, and I couldn't see the material. But what's happening is, if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, this was actually a patient that had Fuji triage placed years ago. They came back, had to have the tooth extracted. Clinically, you could not see the glass ionomer. But when they did a cross-section of this extracted tooth, you can see right there in the middle, it looks like there's a, a, a material that's wedged down in there. That is the Fuji triage that has been placed. So even though you can't visually see the material, it is still down in the grooves and studies show, <clears throat> excuse me, there's typically no signs of incipient lesion because that Fuji triage is still doing its job. Now, I know if you're like me, you're a visual person, you have to see it to believe it. So the thing about it is, is if say the patient comes back a few years down the road and you don't visibly see the glass ionomer, you can place more Fuji triage on top of that and it's okay, it'll still be just as effective. You can add glass ionomer on top of glass ionomer. But let's just say for the sake of if you have a patient that you're not so sure that the parents are gonna be responsible for bringing them back, or maybe they, you, they live in an area where they just don't have access to care, because we know that that happens a lot. And just know that you can rest assured that if you place Fuji triage on there, that there is a very high chance that that material is going to stay in there. But then I also wanted to show you this post-op photo on the left. This is a patient where the Fuji triage was placed. They took a photo three years later, and that material looks just as good as the day it was placed. So again, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but glass ionomers are not known for popping out. They're just known for wearing, but typically they're still in those groups. So again, I want to reiterate, you know, again, when we talk about the chemical bond, we want to make sure that the tooth, you know, is slightly moist. 
Um, so two of the biggest mistakes that people make, and I see this all the time because it is so hard to just not grab that air syringe, but we're in an environment now where we're not, you know, we're forced to not do that. But you don't want to over dry the teeth and you don't want to acid etch. Please do not acid etch with phosphoric acid because the glass downer will not bond to the tooth. We do recommend that you use the GC cavity conditioner, which is a 20% polyacrylic acid not a phosphoric acid. It just helps remove the smear layer. It does not open up tubules and it will not dehydrate the teeth. So keep in mind, do not over dry and do not acid etch. I would almost rather have a tooth a little too moist than not moist enough, okay? So here is a technique, and if you've used Fuji Triage or other glass downers, this technique may look a little bit different, but we developed this for those of you who are minimizing or eliminating aerosols in your practice. So I first want to draw attention to the slide on the upper left hand side. So you can see that this, how this tooth is not um, pooling in saliva, but you definitely can see that the tooth is moist. This is how you want the tooth to look when you place any glass ionomer. So what you're going to do with Fuji Trio is you're going to identify the teeth that need to be sealed. Okay, we used a partially erupted molar here. Then you're going to take a toothbrush or a wet cotton roll and you're just going to remove the gross plaque from the, the occlusal surfaces. Then you're gonna place the GC cavity conditioner on the tooth for 10 seconds. After that, you can then take a soil cotton roll or soil cotton tilt to remove the cavity conditioner. Some people will ask, well, what if you don't fully remove the cavity conditioner? Will that interfere with the bond streak? No, this is the same polyacrylic acid that's actually in the glass ionomer, so it will not interfere with bond streak. So once you rinse that off, you're then gonna take the cap Glass ionomers do come in a capsule. So you're going to take the capsule, you're going to press down your the pink uh, plunger should be pressed into the capsule. You're going to place it in your capsule mixer and mix it for 10 seconds on high speed. Place it in the capsule applier. That capsule applier can then go into the mouth. You're going to place a little dab in the middle of the tooth. Take your glove finger, rub it in the grooves. Yes, I said your glove finger because again with glass ionomers, you really can't contaminate the tooth surface. So it sounds like a lot of steps to do, but just imagine you have a patient in a chair, you have them laid back. If you are allowed to use saliva ejectors, you're gonna have the patient laid back, you're gonna do a quad at a time. Place the saliva ejector on the side that you're working on, just retract the teeth, only use a cotton roll if the tongue is, is hard to manage. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna place the cavity conditioner, wipe it off, you're gonna mix your capsule, put a dab in the middle of the tooth, take your glove finger, work it in, go to the top, Put a dab in the middle of the tooth, take your glove finger, work it in, go to the other side, do the other two, wham, bam, you're done. Again, from start of mix to full setup takes about two and a half minutes. Um, again, if you have a very well-behaved child or very well-behaved patient, you can actually do the whole process. I think when I did my niece, I did her in 45 seconds. So do you have to let the patient stay open for the remaining of the time? Absolutely not. You can get them to bite down on a cotton roll with their front teeth, because again, it doesn't matter if saliva hits it. Or if you have a piece of plastic, let's say what you wrap your air water syringes in, they can bite on that piece of plastic and protect it until it's set up. So I want you to think about all the opportunities out there. You know, Dr. Moss mentioned these partially erupted molars. We know that partially, the best time to do a sealant is when a tooth first erupts. But oftentimes you think, well, we're just gonna watch it. So we you know it may take a year to a year and a half. So why are we watching that? So do, you know, make sure you put Fuji triage on those partially erupted molars. Times when isolation is an issue because glass ionomers love moisture. Incipient lesions, stop watching these lesions. I mean, we're, all we're doing, if there is a lesion in there, is watching it get bigger. If there's not a lesion, then you're leaving the tooth unprotected. So again, there are tons of studies that back the efficacy because it releases fluoride, it acts as a bacterial static agent. It can arrest or reverse the decay process. Environments that do not allow aerosol use, you can still do sealant. So don't stop doing sealant, okay? And then oftentimes you can do it because it is a quick procedure. You can do it the same day as a prophy appointment. Your patients and their parents will love you for not having them to come back. No offense, they may love you as a person, but no one wants to go to the dentist no more than they have to. So think about that. Um, not only is it beneficial to the teeth, but the patients are going to love you for that as well. So indications for this, you know, Fuji triage itself is great for sealant or protective restoration. You can use it as a class five at the gingival margin if you want a lower film thickness material. Incipient lesions, again, please stop watching incipient lesions get bigger. 
You can also use this in the SMART technique if you need a low viscosity of material. And then there's some off-label uses as well, but this is pretty much what indications were used for the Fuji triage. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Kara, and then she's gonna take over on the restorative aspects of it. Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate all the information that you've provided. Is everybody able to hear me with ease? Yes. Okay. All right, and are we all able to see the slide? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, welcome everybody. I appreciate all your time so far. I hope you're enjoying learning about MI uh, approaches and uh, how we are able to utilize glass cyanomers, especially now in this new COVID world that we are living. Uh, what you're seeing right here are most upgraded glass cyanomers, one being the resin modified glass cyanomer, Fuji Automix LC, and uh, the glass hybrid, Equia Forte HT. All right, so we will see why, oh, there we go, perfect. So what we wanna go over are modified restorative techniques during COVID-19. Uh, we have two treatment options that you may utilize. So a lot of you, uh, Dr. Moss talked about a long-term restoration uh, with a high viscosity glass ionomer, as did Michelle. And what we are looking for is if a patient comes in and has decay uh, and we want to limit the aerosols, you know, spoon excavating and getting as much of the soft areas out as possible until we find those margins or borders where we don't have as much uh, softness, glass cyanomer is going to arrest whatever decay you were unable to get with, uh, with a spoon. So what you would do first is excavate, make sure that your area is damp, and then you're gonna place cavity conditioner. And as Michelle stated before, please do not use phosphoric acid etch. That's desiccating the area. You need to have cavity conditioner for the fact that it's a polyacrylic acid. So once that's been placed for 10 seconds, we're going to remove it with uh, not cotton rolls per se, because cotton rolls can't get into those little nooks and crannies. So I would say remove the cotton from the cotton rolls, dampen it, and then wipe out the cavity conditioner. You're limiting uh, rinsing. And then while applying your glass ionomer of choice, uh, you can minimize the polishing by using a slow speed or a cleoid discoid uh, hand tool. Now with the sandwich technique, uh, you choose to use the glass ionomer and then you're gonna be capping it with composite. Uh, by doing so, we're gonna be avoiding the etching process, the rinsing process, the aerosols. And then uh, what we're gonna do is when we're placing the composite on, we're gonna be using a self etching adhesive. So we are limiting the aspect of needing to do multiple steps, but also creating aerosols. And then you're going to determine if you are going to have to use a high speed or you could do a slow speed uh, with soft flex discs afterwards. So this is a nice diagram stating and showing how the modified sandwich technique protocol uh, would be beneficial at this time. Uh, you would apply the cavity conditioner to a wet space and then again uh, remove that cotton from the cotton uh, rolls, dampen it, remove the cavity conditioner. We are going to make the uh, Fuji Automix LC or the capsule form of Fuji 2 LC uh, go to a two millimeter increment in the cavity space, hitting it with the light for 20 seconds. And then the residual tooth structure that we want to mend composite to, we are gonna be placing a self-adhesive uh, bond. We have something called G Premio Bond. And then to fill the rest of the restoration with a composite, uh, we do have a, an injectable, which is like a molten form of a hard, compact composite form, um, but you would do the next two millimeters of that and hit it with the light. Uh, so the Fuji 2LC is a great product. Um, you do need to have a triturator, but its upgrade now takes away that need for the triturator. It's in a hand dispenser, 
And it is still that bioactive, biocompatible material that you love that has the high fluoride release. Uh, Dr. Mast and Michelle were speaking about the rechargeability of the fluoride uh, by having fluoride introduced into the oral environment. And then uh, there is no need for etch, but we do have to have that cavity conditioner and it's adhesing to the tooth chemically when you have water ions present in your cavity uh, space. So that is key. You need to have the area wet, damp, glistening. Uh, if you do not, uh, you will possibly have sensitivity. And we want to say we have virtually no postoperative sensitivity, but we want to be sure to have the area damp because if we have it dry, our material is going to pull on the dent in tubule water, which then we all know is going to become pulpitis. And we don't want it to become irreversible pulpitis. So the key with glass ionomers is please keep it glistening uh, when you are applying. And I totally understand it is a whole new world if you have never used glass ionomers. And that's where we come to, even in the presence of saliva, our material is chemically fusing to the cavity space because again, saliva does have water ion components. Uh, as an off-label use, if you choose not to use the triturated material, Fuji triage, you are able to use this as your sealant alternative. So there are a lot of other bioactive materials that are out on the market, and I wanted to show you how saliva contamination does play a role in its effectiveness. As you can see with the Fuji Automix LC, there's not much discrepancy when there has been no contamination versus saliva contamination. Now, remember, our no contamination would be that the area was rubber dammed, there were water pellets to keep the area um, wet. It's not your traditional resin protocols. Uh, with the Activa, I would suggest that that's something you had interest in. You just look at what their manufacturer's aspect, but their non-contamination is different from our no contamination. But saliva contamination, as you can see, does play a huge role on their effectiveness. We are a fluoride releasing product versus a calcium phosphate made product. And because we're a fluoride releasing product, you could see that the Fuji Automix LC's upgrade is even surpassing that Fuji 2 LC product that you love. And because Activa is not a fluoride releasing product, it is a calcium phosphate product. What we know in dentistry is calcium phosphate and fluoride together do provide an environment. So that's why you're only seeing a day or two of fluoride release with the Activa. Radio opacity is a concern for the fact that a lot of your procedures are uh, reviewed by insurance, so you are then able to uh, be able to be provided uh, pay for your service. And when you are having radio opacity issues, sometimes there's an issue with what's taking place on that aspect. But also, radio opacity is huge for you to have as a diagnostic tool you want to definitively know where your restoration lies and where your tooth structure begins. And then is it decayed where that restoration meets the tooth structure or um, is the tooth structure sound? So it's great to know that the radio opacity is at 270%, making it where that circle is on this diagram, that's how bright you're going to be seeing on the x-ray. I would like to show you a case, a class five case. And because this was in 1991, it is Fuji 2 LC that you are going to be uh, viewing as the end result. So this is where traditionally a lot of people like to use glass ionomers, uh, the class five area. Uh, so here you would be spoon excavating here, all the a curious lesion area, and then you're going to dampen the area and then provide the Fuji 2 LC. You could even do the Fuji Automix LC, but this was a Fuji 2 LC product. This is your end result. Now look at the tissue. Look how it's able to mend up against this restoration material, but also are you able to see the beginning and the end? So it's just this beautiful 
a product that is able to just be able to be aesthetic, but also be very biocompatible. And uh, when it comes to flex, if you were to place composite in that area, we all know that the composite has a higher likelihood of disengaging in that area due to lateral forces. So it's nice knowing that glass ionomer flexes like dentin and is going to have that chemical fusion that's not going to allow for the glass ionomer to uh, pop out abfract in the cervical area. So indications of use, uh, we're able to use it on class one pedos, uh, class three and class five adult restorations, and you could utilize it in the SMART technique, and that is using silver diamine and then applying the Fuji uh, Automix LC uh, as your capping material. And as we stated before, the off-label use, you are able to use it as a sealant when you do not have a capsule mixer available. I am now going to move forward to our self-cure capsule Equiaforte HT glass hybrid. It is a system where you do have to have the capsule, capsule applier, the triturator, and then once you have fully equilibrated slightly out of occlusion, your restoration, you are then coating it with Equia Forte coat. It's a new generation of high strength wear resistant glass ionomer. You're able to actually replace marginal ridges with this material. It is 100% glass ionomer with strontium glass. You are able to place it very quickly because it is a bulk material because it self cures. Again, wet field is what you are needing in order for a glass ionomer to mend to your cavity space. Great aesthetics due to the HT qualities and HT stands for high translucency. Now, again, I'm going to stress, you must have the cavity space wet because we do not want to desiccate the area. And then if it's a vital tooth, have that dentin tubule water pulled on because we really do not want to create pulpitis and or irreversible pulpitis. So um, no, so no post-operative sensitivity. And the longevity of Equia is that of as if you were to place a traditional composite restoration. So this is quite exciting because for those who have caries or high caries risk, uh, you are now able to put an aesthetic, strong material that's going to prohibit a recurrence of decay. So it's 20% higher flexural strength, 21% increase in acid resistance and 40% improved wear resistance. So that coat that I spoke about, what is this coat? What does it do? It is this unique formula that has these uniformly dispersed uh, resin that is going to actually balance out. When you apply it, it will apply more filler where it's needed and less at other areas. What this ultimately does is allows compressive and lateral forces to be applied immediately on a glass cyanomer. It is about six to two years before it wears off, but don't worry, there is no need to reapply this material for the fact that glass cyanomer takes six to nine months to be the strength of a composite. So what we're doing is expediting that whole series by giving you that coat to have the compressive and lateral forces to be applied. And then once they do wear off at that six, to two, six months to two years, you don't have to worry about reapplying the coat because your glass ionomer has matured. It is now the strength of your composites. Here are some competitive benefits. Um, as you could see, we are at the strength of the strongest strength for compressive. Um, and when it comes to wear depth, we do not wear as much as the other products that are available. Look at the fluoride release. We are double and sometimes 10 times that of other restoration materials. And then when it comes to shades, we do have eight for you to choose from. And we're not very far off from our competitor for the surface hardness of one day. And I want you to keep in mind, we being a 100% glass ionomer, I 
want you to do your due diligence and see what these other products are, what their ratios are of glass cyanamide, because that does play a role in how you are going to uh, choose which products to use. So the key features of Equia are that it's high wear resistance, high flexural strength, high acid resistance, and because of that, that's what you get from the high fluoride release, and then you have the high surface hardness. I wanna go along with this case here with the Equia, and we have a buccal pit carious lesion. I'm gonna take a spoon excavator and remove all of the decay. And again, if you don't, what's great about glass ionomer, it's going to arrest it and not allow it to further progress. We're gonna use the cavity conditioner, which again is a polyacrylic acid. And again, just because it's blue doesn't mean that it is phosphoric acid etch. And yes, I've said this a million times, but I really just want you to know that it's very important. Just please use the polyacrylic acid because we do not want to desiccate the area. Once we have filled our area and slightly equilibrated out of occlusion with the Equia Forte, we are then going to place our coat. So now when somebody is able to move laterally, they will not make the product wear. It's going to have a uh, a strength of hardness as if you had placed a composite in this area. But the benefit to the patient is if they are in a high caries risk, this product is going to release fluoride and then not allow for reoccurrent decay to take place uh, near the margin area. Here's another case of pedo. Now I want you to see that this is rubber dammed. And it's very important for you to know that, yes, I'm happy that you are prohibiting other tools and things to fall into the patient's mouth, especially children. But with glass cyanide, we have to remember we need to keep everything damp. So we're gonna be placed in the cavity conditioner once we have removed all of the de decay. We're gonna bulk fill out with the Equia material. At the beginning, it's very flow-like and very shiny. You need to not agitate it until it actually has this nice matte frosty look to it. Once that takes place, that's when you could take a instrument that you are going to be able to create transverse ridges with, uh, fissures. You want to manipulate the material so you're going to have to have as less um, equilibration need afterwards. Once you have used your cleoid discloid, um, and you know that the bite is slightly out of occlusion, we're then going to place the coat and hit that with the light. Now, when placing the coat, this is where the rubber dam is in your best interest because we do want to dry that surface off. So what I would do is take a dry cotton roll, uh, place that on the occlusion real quickly, take the coat, apply it all over the tooth, hit it with the light. There is no air at all because what we're trying to do is have a nice hard shell. So that's why I stress the slightly out of occlusion when you are equilibrating because microns matter. And when we're applying this coat, we don't want to remove the coat because we want this to protect our maturing glass ionomer underneath. And this is our final view. Now I want you to look at this view versus this tooth here, the whole time was not in a rubber dam type situation and look at the aesthetic difference at the final outcome versus the one that we have here. Here we could see definitive borders and margins and uh, more of a frosty like look. If we keep everything wet the whole time, even when we are adjusting, you're going to have more of this look at the end. So I want you to be aware, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. All right, so the indications for use, we have class two, class one, class three, class five, uh, pedo and adult, all ages. And again, we may utilize this for the SMART technique. And the SMART technique, again, is utilizing uh, silver diamine. We're recalling the patient back a week later, making sure that all areas of decay are arrested and then capping it with the Equia material. You are able as an off-label use to use this as a sealant, but you may find that this is much more viscous than your Fuji 
uh, 2LC, Fuji Onomics LC, or especially the Fuji Triage. It is the least viscous product. So this is when we get to that nice part where, now where do I use the glass ionomer? So you wanna know what type of restoration you're trying to accomplish. And then what we spoke of before, fitting the material to the class of dentistry that you're trying to complete. Do we want a certain viscosity? Uh, some people need that feel of compactability. So that would be your Equia product versus others have more faith in if they put the cannula down and they are able to almost do that soft serve out of the restoration or the cavity space and hit it with the light, they feel confident that everything will mend and there are no voids. So viscosity is really up to how you want to uh, manipulate it. And then do you have access to a triturator? If you don't, Fuji Autumn LC is your answer to that. And then is this a patient at high risk for caries? Uh, you want to be providing a solution to your patient and having that restoration material that provides that solution where it's releasing fluoride versus no fluoride at all. This is that choice that you're going to uh, think glass ionomer versus just filling a void. So the paradigm shift, the days of only using glass ionomers for class five is no longer the standard of care. You're able to utilize them in so many other aspects and it's so, uh, it's great to profile your patient to see who is gonna benefit from this glass ionomer product. COVID-19 has really brought more awareness to glass ionomers and it's due to, they're able to really be versatile in the non-aerosol approaches. Before I leave, I just wanted to let you know that Fujisem 2 has upgraded to Fujisem Evolve. Why I'm bringing this up is there's something called an art technique out there where you're able to actually encapsulate where you know that there's decay, but you can't go any further because you don't want to encroach on the um, pulp, so you are doing a triage measure. This product, instead of having to have components using um, dispensers, you now have all-in-one delivery system. You get to tack cure it, remove the cement right away. It is self-curing underneath, so you still have the patient bite down for another three minutes, but also the color change. You're able to use it with lithium disilicate, so you are able to obscure any necrotic prep shade emanating through. So why wait any longer to make enamel stronger? Saving and rejuvenating enamel, think glass ionomer. Here are some additional resources. I urge you to uh, go and read up on the glass ionomers. Uh, I'm here to help anybody with any questions, as is Michelle, Lynn. And here is our information. Uh, we would love to have you contact us and we could delve into this more so for you. And uh, Lynn Waver, uh, if you are in New Jersey, uh, she has a good portion of New Jersey where she'd be able to be at your beck and call whenever you need her if you are in New Jersey. So we appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Joaquin, for having us today. Thank you, Dr. Moss, for being a part of this and thank you Michelle as well for speaking today. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you for your time. <clears throat> there has been several questions. Uh, I want to thank Michelle for uh, taking care of those uh, answers uh, in the Q&A section. Um, if there are any other questions you can raise your hand or type it in the Q&A section. Uh, one question actually is towards uh, Dr. Uh, Joaquin. Um, are we utilizing the techniques at Zoofall? I have someone who needs a tooth restored like this. Yes, we, we are using glass ionomer for uh, sealants and for restorations. Uh, you know, different uh, providers, I think, have different comfort levels with, the, with various techniques, but, but uh, we do have uh, several providers that are using glass ionomers. Yes.
Are there any other questions at this time? Uh, does the ADA endorse uh, the glass ionomer for class two restoration? So I'll take that one. Um, I don't know if the ADA endorses uh, the glass ionomer for class two restoration. Um, I do know that we have five year studies that compare the equia in class twos um, against the uh, composite, the, uh, the composite restorations used in class twos. Um, and at the end of those seven year studies, they do show that the equia forte um, is just as reliable as those composites. And um, I'll be more than happy, I can send those studies to you guys if you want to review them. Um, uh, Dr. Joaquim has our um, information, so um, I, guess I think he can pass out our, our email address if you need more uh, information on that. Oh, thank you. Uh, next question. Can you use the new cement with the pediatric SSC uh, cementation? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so pretty much all the, the indications you could use the Fuji Sim 2 for, and Kara may want to elaborate on this, a little bit more, but yes, this could, this is actually a, a highly recommended cement for that procedure. Yes, definitely. Um, stainless steel, zirconia. I know zirconia is becoming popular um, in the pedo, uh, and uh, lithium disilicate. Uh, that's known as lisi or uh, Emax. So all those substrates are able to easily be cemented with the Evolve. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? And we do have Dr. Belmas with us as well. So if there's any questions for him, he is on the phone and he'll be able to answer those. Um, Sam, looks like no more questions. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maas, um, Michelle, and Kara for a great presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it. Um, as a reminder to attendees, you will receive a survey monkey link after exiting today's session. Please complete the survey to receive your CE certificate if you are seeking dental credit. Uh, CE certificates for today's webinar will be sent out within two weeks. Uh, as a reminder, if the link does not pop up for any reason, you will automatically receive an email uh, with that link within 24 hours. Uh, please use, uh, uh, visit our website and connect with us on Facebook for up-to-date information and flyers on upcoming CE events. We hope you can join us again in the future. If there are any um, uh, requests for additional information or questions about today's presentation, uh, please feel free to contact our special project assistant, Yesenia Olvera at Y. Uh, Olvera, O-L-V-E-R-A, at zoofallhealth.org. Thank you so much. Uh, be well, stay safe, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.